Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, thank you very much for this kind introduction. I normally give this presentation out of my iPad, but uh, <coughs> I've been persuaded to give, the, uh, uh, <coughs> give them a memory stick to do this in this, wow, <laughs> environment. Um, the reason why I use the iPad actually is that I, I get a, a laser pointer that doesn't um, wobble because I can push it on the, um, on the touch thing. Uh, Andy, it's been a wonderful time uh, with you at Microsoft and before. We've known each other for a long time. We've had a company together. We actually made some money together, which is always good. And uh, I hope uh, we'll uh, do something. To, well, we are doing something together with EdSec. So what, what is next? I should have known better. Following Andy uh, giving a talk on You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet, there's going to be a bit of an overlap between mine and his talk. I didn't know that the overlap was going to be quite so comprehensive. Now, the great advantage you have with me is my talk will not be clouded by any facts or any detail, so it will be very high level. And uh, <clears throat> just uh, like with Andy, you cannot make any uh, statements about the future without looking back. So uh, I just want to give you a, a very quick tour of what I think have been the five waves of computing so far and what the next wave is going to be. And if you allow me, I'll just make a few comments on Intel versus ARM. Uh, and then what is next? What is next in low power computing and computer architecture and user interfaces? So the five waves of computing, which of course started off with the mainframe, then the mini computer, workstations, personal computers, and now mobile phones and the cloud, as uh, um, Andy pointed out. And he already talked about the EdSec project. I'm just so excited about this. Uh, and uh, when we talked to Morris about this, as Andy said, he didn't want, to, want us to do it, but now we can. Uh, and uh, it was just a wonderful uh, bit of uh, history. Uh, but the character of that type of machine uh, then became known as a mainframe because you needed uh, a major frame to hold the computer in. And this, uh, if you remember, uh, when, when there were um, reels or uh, videos about computers, that's what you saw. In particular, you saw the tape drives uh, going around because that was the only thing that was active. So you normally saw the tape drives going around to tell you that the computer was working. Well, they were quite expensive. There were a small number of them. They were multi-user. Uh, we saw the teletype, so the, you see this pendulum in computer science going from a lot of thing happening in the center with very dumb things at the, uh, at the terminal, and it sort of shifts where motor computing is actually done on your desk, and then it, now it's shifting uh, back again. And I just list a, a number of characteristics, which you're all very familiar with. Uh, then became the, the, the sort of iconic part of the uh, Max computer. Oh, I should just say uh, that this type of computer actually still exists. There are still mainframes. But if you look at the leading company of that wave, and that's a characteristic of waves, uh, towards the end of a wave, there is always a sort of almost a monopoly position, a monopoly supplier, which in this case was IBM. Now, IBM survived. Uh, as a major company, but basically by reinventing them. IBM is not a, a mainframe company. IBM is uh, one of the world's, real, the, the world's largest service company. But here we, we sort of begin a sort of typical death story of these waves. Uh, this was the VAX 780. If you had told anybody uh, at, that, uh, at the height of the mini computer uh, era with a company that just was admired by everybody. It was the most competent computer company in the world, that this computer company will die. It will actually not exist in a few years. Uh, everybody would have said, you have to have your head examined. And yet, this is what happened. DEC basically disappeared. It, was, uh, it, it is no longer. Why? Why did such a competent company in many ways, at the 
top of its game, because DEC became not incompetent, DEC became irrelevant. And that's the key uh, point to look at as we go through these waves. And again, some, some characteristics. The nice thing is that Ethernet appeared during that uh, period, so lots of them got networked in an interesting way. And here we get the next one, the third wave, which is workstations. Again, towards the end, after Apollo and uh, the sun has had a, a spat, um, and of course there were lots of workstation computers at the moment, and they were wonderful in the, in the way that they gave you a nice graphical interface, and uh, uh, they were known as the 3M uh, uh, machines, uh, one megapixel, one MIP of processing power, and one megabyte of uh, memory. What would you possibly do with uh, a megabyte of memory? I also remember getting four megabytes of our IBM um, 370 in the computer lab for 200 users. And honestly, people asked me what we're going to do with the four megabytes because there's so much that we'll never fill it up. And it's sort of inconceivable now, but, uh, but this, is, this is how the way, we th the way we thought about computers. So same story. Sun, uh, uh, just uh, a, a wonderful company, incre incredibly competent, uh, but it is no more. It was um, bought by... Um, uh, uh, Oracle. And again, a, a revolution in, in the computer architecture uh, based on risk, on the reduced instruction set computers, on Unix, on very high quality uh, <coughs> CRTs that uh, uh, one could use um, <coughs> as your personal computer in many ways because the computer moved out of the of a central uh, um, air-conditioned facility onto the desk of users, and of course Ethernet again was them. Now if you excuse a little uh, uh, acorn machine there, or characterize uh, the, the personal computer world, uh, again everything changed. Uh, uh, a new wave uh, that basically displaced workstations as the main wave, the main computing facility, and uh, I remember very well people uh, actually, my fifth wave talk uh, is my fourth wave talk 20 years later, just uh, uh, updating it a little bit. And when I first gave this uh, fourth wave talk uh, and predicted that uh, workstations will die because personal computers will kill them, um, people said, you know, that was crazy. I, I did this, the personal computer is a toy. Uh, you know, don't, we're not taking personal computers seriously. And yet, of course, because they were cheaper, they eventually reached the uh, compute power of workstations, and in the end, there was no reason to have a workstation because all the things that you could do with a workstation, you could do with a, a PC anyway. And again, uh, after, <coughs> after a while of uh, the domination, it's very interesting that the dominant companies, until Sun, uh, were actually uh, companies that understood computers. Uh, now, the dominant company is not a computer company at all anymore. Uh, and I'll come to the exception of Apple in a moment. But if you look at the, the main producers of PCs, they actually don't understand what they're doing anymore. They're just uh, you know, fancy assembly houses, but they don't understand the microprocessor that's done by Intel. They don't understand the operating system that's done by Microsoft, uh, and they don't understand any of the other chips that they, had, that they buy from, uh, from people. So they're really just fancy uh, assembly houses. So Dell, of course, is the sort of main uh, example of that. But there is one exception. Uh, the, the, the computer history has, uh, since the 50s has been characterized by what some of us call the horizontalization of the industry, where uh, IBM took the sand off the beaches and made the chips, that made the circuit boards, that made the uh, computers, wrote the operator, uh, wrote the, wrote, invented the language, wrote the operating system, wrote the application, delivered the uh, IBM mainframe, serviced it for you, and then took it away from you at the, at the end of the day. So they did soup to nuts. And soon they realized that there are other people that can make at least the ingots better than IBM could. So there was an ingot um, horizontalization. And it, uh, horizontalization has always happened when an interface could be, can be defined well. So once you could define what the wafer should do, what the error rate should be, what the defect density should be, et cetera, then other people can, can do it. And, and the whole industry benefited from that because now everybody could buy wafers to the same uh, a standard. Uh, the same thing happened again in the silicon industry where uh, it was the case that real men had fabs because unless you had a fab, 
you couldn't produce a good chip. And it was the introduction of the GDS2 tape that allowed the separation of the design activity from uh, the actual production. And now we have got companies like TSMC that produce the chips and companies like Broadcom or CSR or ICRA uh, that produce the um, design for them. And of course, the archetypal uh, PC was the original IBM PC. In fact, it coined the phrase uh, when we brought out our Acorn computer. It was a home computer. The, the, co the, the concept of a personal computer uh, was coined by IBM with this, with this product uh, uh, here. Now, uh, of course, I'm going to predict that PCs will die in the same way that uh, all the other uh, units have died. Now, why will they die? Well, they will not die as a form factor. Of course, that form factor, uh, that clamshell factor, is actually quite a convenient factor. But PCs will die as an architecture, and they will uh, be killed uh, for the same reason that all the previous com uh, computing waves have been killed. Well, killed in the sense they, they become a minor sort of niche activity. Uh, and the first thing is always price. You remember I had a price for the mainframes, the mini computers, and the thing. Well, mobile phones cost from zero to $100. Now, it's hard to compete with zero. Uh, and the reason for that, of course, is that uh, uh, people pay an annuity in the contract that they do. But the, the interesting uh, next thing is the use case. Uh, as a new wave comes, the use case widens enormously. And people use these computing elements for many more things than in the previous uh, way. And in particular, mobile phones are produced, for, are produced every, um, are used everywhere. Uh, when I was uh, vice president of research for Olivetti, I divided computers uh, <coughs> not by what they did, but where they lived. There were ones that lived in the air-conditioned room, ones that lived on the desk, the others that lived in the briefcase and ones that lift in your jacket pocket, and ones that lift on your wrist. And, I, I wrist, and I'm sort of very disappointed that the ones that live on your wrist, uh, wrist haven't really appeared yet. But uh, anyway, so location everywhere. Uh, there are dominant companies again, and there's a very interesting thing happening. Nokia had a 40% market share, unbelievably large market share in uh, mobile phones just a few years uh, ago. And of course, Apple is now the, uh, the dominant supplier of um, mobile phones in the, in the sense of, of brand recognition and, and leadership. And of course, I'm very pleased to report that there is a, uh, a microprocessor that is in 95% of mobile phones, and it's a local company here called ARM. Um, and there are also nice things, of course, uh, uh, each of the waves also has new networking capabilities, uh, and this uh, 3G, and particularly uh, the introduction of LTE, and I've just uh, I had reports from uh, Cambridge Broadband System that is just yesterday fired up its LTE backhaul uh, uh, solution that the experience they now have with LTE is better than Wi-Fi. So have a 13, um, 14, they reported yesterday, 14 megabits down, 11 megabits up uh, on a you know, wide area network, which is uh, great. The other interesting thing is um, that we've got an OS revolution it used to be completely dominated by Symbian. Then we've got this remarkable growth of Apple and Android. And I don't have Microsoft in there, but actually Microsoft uh, uh, threatens us with uh, actually a very uh, nice new version of uh, Windows uh, and has shacked up with um, Nokia. Uh, and I think to write those two off in the mobile phone business would be rather premature. So here are the mobile phones and, of course, Apple's iPhones. So why does a new wave uh, always win? Much higher volume. Uh, PCs, I think, about 300 million a year. Mobile phones, 1.3 billion a year. Much lower price. Uh, new wave reaches old wave uh, um, capabilities in terms of the processing power and the display uh, capabilities. So uh, mobile phones now are perfectly good uh, high quality sort of gigabit, uh, a thousand MIP machines, um, and they can uh, uh, display videos up to uh, high definition standard. <clears throat> the unexpected thing to me, uh, for me, was really the explosion of apps, that so many new things uh, would be available to people on mobile phones. 
that could have been available on, um, uh, on laptops or PCs, but let, let me give you just one example. I'm one of those guys who rather lives, likes the Boris bikes in um, London. So if I'm on my Boris bike and I want to find where to leave the bike, of course there is an app that tells me how many space, free spaces there are close to our offices in, uh, uh, in London and where I can go. And of course I do this with my mobile phone. Well, would I uh, take out my laptop, open it up on my uh, basket? Uh, uh, no, of course I wouldn't. So it's these uh, new uses that are important. You remember the workstations vis-a-vis uh, -vis PC. PCs killed the workstations, and here is the reason why uh, tablet computers, e-readers, and, and lots and lots of other new fac uh, uh, form factors will, will appear, uh, will basically kill the PC architecture, not the PC uh, form factor. Just the last one, since I haven't talked about this, uh, whenever you get a new computer wave, you often get a new storage wave as well. Uh, you know, the, the tapes characterized the mainframes, and then the, the hard disks were really sort of a revolutionary part of the uh, workstation uh, market. And now, because disks are really quite awkward things because they're mechanical, it is actually the uh, flash technology that has now reached a maturity uh, that uh, is good enough to have quite substantial storage. Um, and there are laptops around now with uh, 256 uh, uh, gigabytes of uh, flash memory, and that will soon go up as well. In fact, when I was um, VP of research, I plotted the speed, and this is all log plots, of course, of the increase of hard disk capacity. And then I plotted the speed with which a semiconductor, uh, uh, the, the semiconductor storage goes up, and found that the crossover was actually the year 2000. This was in the mid-80s. What I didn't uh, know was that the uh, hard disk industry had uh, this change just after I made my, my prediction with uh, a giant magnetic uh, resistive technology. So they had a slightly longer uh, life uh, than I expected, but that crossover is, uh, is happening now. So there is this uh, risk versus risk story. Uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable that ARM actually took a breakthrough that was done in Silicon Valley at Stanford and at Berkeley, and the first implementation of risk uh, technology, which you would expect would have happened in Silicon Valley, did not happen in Silicon Valley. It happened here in Cambridge. We brought this architectural breakthrough here, and the first commercially available risk processor was the ARM, and held the rec world record for MIPS per watt, which nobody thought was an important parameter for many years, and that's how it became uh, the standard uh, on mobile phones. And here, We've got this wave story, you know, that 10 times, we produce 10, actually it's more like 20 times as many ARMs per year as Intel. Uh, last year was the first year where the value of the ARM chips worldwide, uh, as you know, ARM is a licensing company, so we don't actually sell uh, processors, we're just licensing them, but the value of the ARM processors overtook Intel uh, microprocessor revenues. So in dollar terms, ARM is now an import, more important architecture than Intel, but the uh, sort of, uh, most amazing um, thing, because ARMs are growing so fast, they grew by 50% last year, is that this year uh, we will ship 7 billion ARMs, which is more than people on Earth, and more than the Intel shipments in its entire history of the company. So these are impressive uh, figures. And the, the, the reason why Intel's microprocessor business is going to die, as I predict, which is a... <laughs> which you know, is as wild as somebody predicting that DEC would d disappear, but it, it's the same reason. It's not that Intel has become uh, incompetent. Intel is the most competent microprocessor uh, company in the world. They're absolutely brilliant. They're just becoming irrelevant. And the reason why they become irrelevant is that the main uh, uh, story that they pushed in the, uh, very successfully in the computer industry to concentrate the entire world on a single processor uh, is the wrong way to go, and uh, that will be the rest of my talk. And by the way, this is not Intel versus ARM. Uh, this is a, a fight between Intel and everybody else in the world, because there are 200 semiconductor companies in the world that have an ARM license. In fact, there isn't a single uh, large semiconductor company in the world that doesn't have a license, including Intel. Uh, and therefore, <clears throat> I think the ARM as an architecture will prevail because it's simpler, uh, lower power, and cheaper.
And Intel can't respond, uh, if I can just say why Intel is going to lose. Intel is not losing because uh, they're incompetent. They're, they're losing because they've got the wrong business model. If you sell a microprocessor into uh, the fifth wave of computing, which is the mobile wave, and the, uh, your customers in the fifth wave of computing don't buy microprocessors, you've got a problem because you've got a, a product that has no market. What people, of course, do in the uh, fifth wave of computing is they license the processor and do the processor themselves because the processor in the mobile phone business has become a sideshow as opposed to uh, the PC. Uh, in the PC, the processor is the number one chip. Everybody talks about, you know, do you have a, a 2.4 gigahertz uh, computer? They hardly talk about microprocessors in the, in the mobile phone business. It's not become the, the, the sort of key thing. It's really the, the usability, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the battery power, um, et cetera. And uh, so, the, uh, the, the key thing really is uh, the change in the business model. And these are just uh, all the licensees uh, of ARM. So what about the future? What about, uh, as Andy said, I, I do believe uh, that the future is this mobile phone architecture plus the cloud. That this mobile phone architecture will dominate, but the cloud needs low power. So what about the next uh, computing architecture? Well. This has a lot to do with low power. Uh, and I don't know how many of you know this. I'm surprised that even many computer scientists uh, don't know of the Landau principle. But, but us physicists have sort of some uh, affinity uh, with this. And this uh, principle says, uh, there's a principle of reversible computing, if you actually set up uh, your computer to do reversible computing, in principle, the computer doesn't need any power at all, sort of slightly counterintuitive that you can do computing without power. Now, you know, this is assuming no friction and no resistance, et cetera, but in principle. And so now let's look at uh, if you're realistic about this, uh, if you're not reversible because it's uh, sort of rather difficult to retain all the intermediate results and not destroy some of the bits, how much entropy uh, do you produce by destroying the bits, which is the only way uh, that the theory says you're actually consuming power. Well, one bit destroyed is kT log 2 of, of energy. Now, those of you that remember the uh, A-level physics, k, of course, is Boltzmann constant, so it's about 10 to the minus 23. A t is uh, room temperature, so it's about 300, so it would be 10 to the minus 21. Log 2 is 1. Uh, <coughs> and how much energy, how, how, much, how many bits can I destroy and still consume very little power? Let, well, let's say we, 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 we destroy a terabyte. You know, it's 10 to the 13. Well, 10 to the uh, 23 is 10 to the 13, is still 10 to the 10, throw in the 10 to the 2 for the, um, uh, for the temperature. You're still talking about nanowatts. So, even if you destroy uh, lots of information and thereby generate heat, uh, the theoretical limit of how power efficient we can be is way, 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 way uh, beyond where we are at the moment. So right now, as Feynman said, there's a lot of room at the bottom. Well, there is enormous room for improvement if we're just clever about the architecture. And one of the ways to start is get rid of caches. In my opinion, caches are for squirrels, but not uh, for computer architectures. Because even Henry Ford knew that if you're on an on a assembly line, the way you make sure uh, you're very efficient in assembling your Model T is you handle your nut once or you take hold of your wheel once and you put it where it belongs. You don't give it to somebody else to put it somewhere else. And this is basically what cache is too. Nowadays, not just once, but twice or three times because we've got level one, level two, level three caches. These, are, these all destroy or consume a lot of unnecessary power. Well, it's only unnecessary power if you, uh, <coughs> you know, um, pray at the altar of... Uh, uh, the Intel God that wants everything to go through one or a few processes. 
uh, you really want to have lots of processors uh, doing a lot of work for you at the edge. So you really want to have hierarchical computing, not parallel computing. And forget about this virtualization thing. You don't want to have virtualization, you want to have physicalization. You actually want to have a processor doing each, a separate processor for each of the things that you want to do. Now, there are of course lots of examples in cloud computing, uh, exceptions in cloud computing in particular, but for the, for the large majority of terminals, uh, at least, or the things that we typically want to do when we interact with them uh, as humans, uh, you really want physicalization. And you want to do this in a programmable, real-time, deterministic uh, fashion at the edge, a la Exmos. This is a, a great surprise to me when, when David May uh, came to see me and said, uh, Herman, I want to do another processor. Uh, and I said, David, watch my lips. The world does not need another microprocessor. And he said, ah, but mine is different. I said, okay, go on. Well, and, and what he, uh, what he uh, came up with, which is absolutely brilliant, is a microprocessor uh, that actually behaves more like an FPGA. It's an event processor. It's, it's a processor that is very, very interruptible. So reacting to the outside world. And I think uh, if there is any theme that I would say is the number, uh, uh, the, the next theme for computing, it's really having a much better relationship uh, with the real world than we've had uh, in the past. And uh, this new processor, which might well become a front-end processor to an ARM, uh, could do a lot of that in a programmable rather than an FPGA uh, manner. So which brings me to, the, to some high-level remarks without any detail so that I don't get caught out because I don't really understand this in, in, in detail. But <clears throat> I talk to lots of people that do. And what they tell me uh, is that Bayesian inferences need good priors. So how do you get good priors? How do you, get, uh, how you, how do you inform yourself about uh, the world in particular? How do you inform yourself about the person that you serve? Andy talked about the assistant being a very important part of future computing environments. Uh, well, there's a very nice local uh, company called True Knowledge that has just launched um, a program called Evie. Now, Evie is your friend. Uh, she is now, she's a person. She is, uh, lives, only lives in a computer. She is, I think, about uh, four weeks old. Um, but she learns a lot about you. She, she sort of helps you do conversational search. Uh, so if you say, I'm hungry, she would say, well, the last time you were hungry and you were uh, you know, in the marketplace, you actually went to Tom Pasquale because you like Italian. Uh, and so the, knowing a lot of things about you uh, knowing, having senses that knows where you are, what the temperature is, you know, do you want to sit outside? I normally uh, want to sit outside to, uh, during the summer. A video, audio, you've, uh, I mean, the, the research here is, is fantastic in order to uh, <coughs> take advantage of a lot of the uh, sensor input that we have and new interfaces, touch, gestures, um, and so on. I think smells will be increasingly important as well. And let me just make a few remarks about voice, because I seem to be one of the very few people in the, in the world who have made money doing, supporting voice recognition companies uh, three times over. Uh, this is a, uh, you know, m m most people have lost uh, money in doing voice recognition. Well, uh, we have a wonderful, um, completely unknown uh, facility uh, here in the engineering lab uh, run by, by Steve Young. Uh, it's actually the best uh, voice recognition group in the world. Uh, and it remains the best. How do I know this? Well, there's a yearly shootout by DARPA that compares all the voice recognition systems in the world, and we've won it every time, I think, for the last 10 years with bigger margins. Uh, so it's always good to talk to Steve. And what he tells me is this is the way voice recognition works. Well, the way it works is that you, audience, form hypotheses about what I'm uh, going to say. If it fits in with what you think I'm going to say, you know, you think I'm a good speaker and you remember it. If it doesn't fit in what you, what you think I'm going to say, you forget it and think the speaker was rubbish. That's, that's the way uh, it works. And occasionally you check with me whether your, uh, you know, your uh, hypotheses uh, were correct or not. So, understanding uh, the, the, the context, uh, knowing um, who I am and what I'm likely to say, uh, is very important for uh, your understanding. So building up a good model is, is key. 
So in conclusion, I talked about five ways of computing plus the clashes uh, like uh, ARM and Intel. Uh, that mobile computing uh, is, uh, is the key. So the, the new mobile computing environment uh, for Microsoft, we're all uh, awaiting with bated breath. Uh, the rumors that are coming out, I think, are very positive, And I think we need good competition for uh, Apple and, uh, well, Apple in particular, because the last thing that we want is to have a total monopoly of, uh, uh, of one company um, in the mobile computing space. Uh, I talked about next architecture, uh, which in my opinion should be very hierarchical. I mean, uh, multiprocessor, but hierarchical in real time. And the user interface has to be holistic, taking all the different senses and all the different bits of information that we have about uh, uh, information uh, into account. Andy, I'm very much looking forward to uh, continue working with you in your, uh, in your new life, and I'm looking forward to rebuilding EdSec with, uh, with you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Herman. Now, how are we for time? We might have time for one or two questions, if, uh, I suppose, if, either, if there are. But, uh, sure, sure. Anybody? Uh, yes. I've been, uh, David Wallace, who's going to, I mean, is ARM going to drive the compute power in the cloud or, or what? Um, well, uh, of course, I would uh, like it to, and there's some early signs. If you talk to any uh, uh, of the database companies, uh, they will tell you that their number one problem is power. Uh, it's not uh, performance, but it's the actual uh, energy, and that's why many of these uh, big data centers are now built next to power stations, or they actually build the power stations together with the, uh, with the data centers. And there are some startups uh, like Smoothstone that say that they can reduce the power consumption by a factor of 10 using an ARM architecture rather than Intel architecture, but only time will see whether they will, can actually achieve it. Andrew. Um, in, the new, uh, in the new world where the uh, PC goes away and mobile becomes dominant. I'm fascinated to know what your view is of what will happen to displays. Uh, good question. Uh, sometimes I get asked about, um, you know, the sixth wave of computing, what are we going to have after, uh, after mobile? And my answer is no computers. Uh, so uh, the, really the computing environment around you will be so rich that you don't need to carry thing, anything uh, with you. So. Uh, there are so many displays as there are here. You just walk up to the closest display and say, well, I use this one. And uh, I mean, you've done more work on this than <laughs> anybody else uh, in, in doing the gestures so that you uh, combine the right computing. You, you, you've got enough computing, of course, in the cloud, so you don't need any computers. The only thing that you really need is the bits that interact with the, uh, with the environment. And whether you actually need to carry anything with you at all even whether you need to carry identity with you, uh, you know, given uh, biometrics, is uh, is questionable. I don't know, but but you know, that would be my answer. Thank you. Um, one more question, Rick. Yes. So, so if I were Google, I, what I might say in this sense is that why are processors even relevant? It's all about data. Yes. I mean, and in some sense, from their perspective, or. or and, there are other people in this space too, the, it's really the data that matters and what processor delivers the service that goes with the data is irrelevant. Well, my, my, my sort of long-term you know, uh, gut feeling about this, and uh, I, I've got to defer to the clever computer <coughs> architects to fill in the details here, sort of a, as a physicist who sometimes sees the forest for the trees. I think it's, it's really, the integration of memory and processor uh, that points the right way. This is the way the brain does it. And uh, it makes a lot of sense to do a lot of local computation uh, that is almost embedded uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the memory. The fact that we ended up with this architecture where out there there's memory and I pull it all in and have this tiny bottleneck that, uh, uh, called a NALU that, that I go through and then I uh, put it out there, it just seems intrinsically wrong. Uh, I think it's an aberration that has to do with, you know, we had to uh, walk before we could run. And we, we've walked rather well. I mean, the things that we've managed to achieve with a very small number of processes is phenomenal. 
and yet, you know, if one looks at the sort of next big things that we need to do, I think, uh, uh, and, and I, I, I think the clue must come from the brain, if we can recognize faces out of, I don't know how many thousands, maybe tens of thousands, in point two of a, uh, my, um, uh, a second, this can only be done by highly parallelized filters where a lot of the processing goes on uh, uh, embedded with the, with the memory that the processors have of what, what you've seen before. So, I mean, this is a very hand-waving <laughs> thing, uh, uh, <clears throat> but that's sort of my gut feel where, where I think it needs to go. All right, thank you very much, Herman. Uh, very, very interesting talk and interesting questions. Thanks.